So this evening, the topic for the career forum is business and culinary. So um, I'm going to let each presenter introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they do um, in the community, and and then we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions you might have after we've done our presentation. So we'll just start with Carolyn. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm Carolyn Thompson. I'm a certified public accountant in town. Uh, I'm just down here. I grew up in Crusade and North Bend. I went to North Bend and Point Elementary and graduated from Stock in '84. We went on to Oregon State University. We will be touring to University of Oregon where I dumped the Bachelor of Arts because I couldn't learn French. So I decided to go to science. <laughs> they were on the same page here. <laughs> um, Coming out of Oregon State, I know the catch panel asset and started my practice as a CPA. Um, and came back here in 91 and worked for a number of firms. We got fired. Now I'm competing with them and I'm doing pretty darn good. Um, SWAP was important to me. I didn't have a family setting. And so there was a lot of teachers here on campus that really Care deeply for those students and make sure they talk to them. Um, the academy degree is so multifaceted and so without limits. Being a CPA is such a fine thread of what you can do with an accounting degree. Um, you can work for a big firm. You know, I think we're down to, I don't know, at least we have big A or down to the major four or something. You can do a small firm. You can create your own firm, like I did. Um, private industry, there's millions of businesses out there that need bookkeepers and accounts every day. Or you can go to government, do fund accounting, swap, with uh, that be and being the CFO for swap and follow that line and work in a school district or uh, any city or county fire district. Um, you can choose not to sit for that darn exam, which when I took it was a two and a half day exam. We walked in with only a pencil. And now it is online and you can take sections at a time over a course of days and they have quarterly openings to take it and it's computerized and you need a calculator and all that stuff. When I took it, it was just mucking it out by hand, 40% was. Essay, and I think they're kind of gotten away from the essay. You don't have to be a CPA to use an accounting degree and be incredibly profitable and enjoyable in your life. According to a 2013 study by the Virginia based America Center, Americans spend up to $378 billion annually in tax related accounting costs. And in 2011, Americans spent more than six billion hours complying with the tax code. So you can be a CPA like me and, and get involved in the code and all of that stuff. You can be a bookkeeper or a support person that that um, adds or plays a part in all of that. That's these hours are equivalent to an annual hour workforce of 3.4 million for the number of people employed by four of the largest companies, Walmart, IBM, McDonald's, and Target combined. So, people always think accounting degree, CPA, doing taxes for the rest of my life, and it's so far different than that. Most of your large companies, their CFOs, their CEOs, have an accounting background because they're, quite frankly, some of the most qualified to be making some of these business decisions and understand the incredible detail of the tax code plays a part of in all of that. So if you do become a CPA, the exam consists of four parts. It's four hours of auditing, four hours of business environment and concept, which deals with different business structures, financial management, technology and planning. There's four hours of financial accounting, and there's four hours of law. 16 hours. I've heard some say that the CPA exam is far harder than the law exam. 
you know, I've had friends who've taken both, and it's it's tough. Now that was back in their day days when all of those. I'm sure it's a lot easier when you apply technology to it today. Have have the ability to have a calculator, maybe testing more on the understanding of concepts as opposed to the hand multiplication of numbers. Benefits of being in the accounting profession, and one thing that I got into. Uh, one of the reasons I got into, I had a writing professor here, his name was Humphrey. Everyone said, you just can't get a good grade at Humphrey. He's going to seize the best job. And I did my research paper, I was writing 123, on the effects of daycare on children because I wanted to be an accountant and be able to work from home. Don't ever do it. It doesn't work. Um, and he, he gave me an A, you know, and I learned that the effects of daycare just wasn't that bad. But what this profession has allowed me is incredible flexibility. I'm right now interviewing for a bookkeeper payroll specialist in my office, and as a small firm where I don't have 19 people that have to um, comply with a rigid policy, I can offer anyone that wants to come to work for me incredible flexibility to be with family. The job gets done, the job gets done. You don't have to sit there to desk. Um, and, and again, many of the major business leaders in America worldwide are accountants. I'm sorry. That's my shtick. Do you have any questions? I know it's all pretty good. This is the hardest part of your job. Of my job? Um, I'm a little sour right now because I think politicians should stay out of tax law. But uh, basically, the hardest thing is every time we get new leadership in this nation, they mess with the tax code. And the tax code was in the 1922, I believe, was started. And this last time, they wrote a tax code with no practical application for us as practitioners. So it's still going through the court system now to figure out revenue rules, how it applies. So to read law, to um, digest it, and to apply it to a form, and take what politicians have written as opposed to what maybe a tax professional might write, there's a gap. And we have to navigate that gap. And we're wrong in a lot of times. And we go back and correct ourselves. So the changing culture in terms of tax, which I'm dealing with mostly right now, um, is frustrating. And I think you see a lot of CPAs retiring because they're just fed up. Um, financial accounting, financial statements, corporate financial statements. That too evolves all the time. There's a lot of pressure right now to go to a fair market value type of system to make us more comparable with other countries. That has its drawbacks, as we saw when we valued real estate, it was really exaggerated. Balance sheets would be blown out of proportion to what <coughs> the value of those assets really were. And we saw the banking industry collapse because there was a lot of overvaluations done. The other license I have is a CBA, Certified Valuation Analyst degree or license, and I can value businesses. Um, I'd have to drop that as of December because there's a larger firm in town that does a lot of them and I can't do. I, I just don't have enough work to be what I would consider um, worthy of <coughs> being cross examined on. I mean, I can find where uh, I can find logic in my numbers and I can go through all of the hoops, but if I have to be cross examined on, that, on the stand, I don't know that I can explain to who's in the audience what beta is in this situation, because I'm not a statistician. And a lot of those people do a lot of valuations. They're, they're totally understanding status, statistical stuff, which I just, that's too much for me right now. You know, going to it. So I'll just stick to tax and, and financial statements, which is, keeps me busy now, you know. But th th there's a lot of flexibility. Hi, Hi, Carol. 
You know, and, and the greatest joy really is taking people's pieces and putting them together so that they can see how their business is doing, even though they're not accountants, just to facilitate that educational process for the design so that they understand what they're having. And, and after a few years, it gets better and better and better. They understand way more how. So 35 years. No complaints. Pays the bills, you know. Anything else? If you could give one piece of advice that would help students get the most out of their educational experience, what would it be? What piece of advice would you wish you could talk to or that you got as a student? Hmm. I followed my passion. I had a high school teacher that told me his name was Jim Whitty and told me from the get-go that I needed to be an accountant. He was a beautiful high school teacher that allowed me to buzz through two years of accounting in just one semester. He just kept yeah, And I just kept so in the game. So someone there saw that ability in me and that passion in me. And I would hope that whatever thing you want to do with the rest of your life, there's a passion there that drives you each and every day so it doesn't become such a mundane routine that you get up in the morning and you pour your coffee and you roll your eyes and you drag it out into work. You know, it's got to be better than that. I found one, you know, and it was just by the grace of God that I had a good high school teacher that gave me the rest of school. <laughs> Anything else? Quick and dirty. If you ever have questions, I'm in your phone book. At least for the next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs>
this is a no person's job. This is not this is not gonna work out for me long term because at 26, 26 is over. I had um you would take like 12 foot bars of clothing and like put them up on um you know big you know big racks. I mean I would do it in high heels. This was like the 90s, so like we were rocking that spice roll look with these like four inch heels and lifting all these things and I thought, oh, you know, and I, I just kind of always sort of thought like a few years ahead. Um, as far as like short term and long term goals, I thought I need to really take that internet of like training and development and um, and focus on that. And what how can I do that? Well, one of the things that you can do besides you know managing um, you know spaces is you can focus just on human resources. And so that's where you know a lot of companies will have it divided up where there's specialists in each organization. So you have somebody who just does human resources, like in payroll. We'll do that that wing of it, or we'll just um, do the benefits. And I thought, oh, again, I'm the best, filling out filling out benefits paperwork all day long. I mentioned like put daggers in my eyes, like that's not what I want to do. Uh, but I ended up finding a job at, at a department store in Southern California where I got to do have my hands on all of the spots, and it was great because I did a little bit of the payroll, I did a little bit of the benefits, but a lot of training um, and, and teaching people to how to be managers. And so I'm like, this is it. This is my, this is the niche that I um, want to have. So I remember one day, this is a, a very large department store in Los Angeles. And I'm, just, you know, I'm standing there in front of a, a room of like, I mean, we, we would train 100 people at a time during the holiday season. And um, somebody's like, you should be a teacher. And I'm like, I should. I should be a teacher. And that's, that's really like how it, how it happened because I had been that generalist um, position. I got to do all the classes that I teach now, retail, and you know, going over uh, HR and management. And I thought that would be amazing. You have to end up making some choices in life, though. And this was about the time when I was getting married. My husband and I were thinking about our lives and um, what we wanted. And he's an IT guy, so he's a computer a computer person. And um, it's a very different track. And so a lot of this, a lot of my friends at the time, you know, they ended up working for like corporate Starbucks and they're at Apple. You know, great salaries, but it's you know they're on the 405 down in Los Angeles working these insane hours. And when I thought I want I want to be a teacher, I knew some of the benefits that came along with that. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have flexibility during the summer, and so that ended up really working out um, great for me. So I went back to school. Um, my we got uh, booted overseas for a couple of years for my husband's computer job. I got my MBA online. And I just kept researching what community colleges were looking for. And most community colleges, they want you to have people who have a hands-on experience. And I'm like, that's me. That's perfect because I've been in the industry for 20 plus years in human resources and management. And I did like that job, but training and development was my favorite. So I knew I'd be able to translate that to the students. And so also now what I do in the community, it's really important for me. I don't ever want to be this person who just sort of, you know, read about business, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I still stay really active. So I'm on several boards, um, including Bay Area Enterprise and um, who may help find jobs with people with um, disabilities. So I lend my, I keep my, my HR hat. I'm in the law, you know, really handy there. Um, I also sit on another board called CCD, and they're a certified development company, and it's a, it's a funding source for small businesses. And then, um, and then somebody said you should run for city council. I'm like, I should. That'd be a great idea too. And uh, how could I affect change at even a larger level and um, work with, you know, just the the area that I grew up in, um, bring some changes. So, so there's that. And so if you have any specific questions about the human resources side of things, management, and you know, in all of those roles too, because a lot of them, especially the department store, you would wear so many hats, I actually got to do some marketing for them as well. I can answer any questions if you have anything specific about business. But I guess my advice for you is I think it's the most marketable degree because you can do anything in it. I mean, look at all the different jobs and roles that I've had. And if you, and if you, if you get a job someday and you're like, oh, like the benefits paperwork, like that's not for me, then you can go on the other side of things and do something in, in payroll or you can change that up and do something in marketing. So getting a bachelor's degree in business administration, um, I would be like one of the top things that I recommend for, um, for anyone. So any specific questions about any of those types of jobs or maybe things that we do on the council? Did I 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was. What, it's so so funny the impact that people say things to you, um, and, and now it can like just really have like these defining moments in your life where you're like, yeah, I'm trying to change that. I think part of that is also it was just it was finding the joy in what you do. And I knew that there was a lot of different things that I could do with my career, but again, like working like one on one directly with people in that training and development um, kind of thing, and again, helping people be the best they can be. That's what I get to do with students. And we'll have some really tough conversations someday where, you know, if they are struggling, say, in accounting or they're struggling in computers, I'm like, I don't know who's the right, you know, career for you. You know, we need to look at something else and just kind of getting to be a little bit, I guess, in my past, like maybe I was a therapist. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time. If you are looking for some specific electives, especially in, in the transfer degree or in the um, computer science degree, one of my favorite classes to teach is called Human Relations and Organizations. We do a lot of self-reflection in that class and look at I, the term paper that the students are writing is, um, they write kind of like a roadmap to life, what they want. And so they do a personal mission statement. They write some short-term and long-term goals about what they want and how they're going to get there. And I'll have, a, I've had a student once, she went through the whole thing and she found out, she's like, I don't want to be in business. I'm like, good. That was the point of this exercise. Or another one was they wanted to be a teacher and they started looking at some things like call up places to find out what is the hiring process, what's the starting way. She found out how much elementary school teachers make. And she said, nope. <laughs> and so, um, so it is meant to, you know, really take a look at like, your next step. So that's called BA 35 Human Relations and Organizations. Uh, we also talk a little bit about how not to be a jerk at work in that class too. So really, most all the business classes you can probably take this elective. So I'd love to see you in any of my classes, and you guys can always find me on the faculty website too. It's Jessica Inglekey, and my office is over in Sydney. All right, and I did it in ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. So if you have uh, someone that needs to get through five minutes of help. I think that is a perfect transition because um, I'm Stephanie from KDOC Radio. You probably have heard of that, KDOC Digital 360, and also KDOC Sound and Music. KDOC is our main business. It's a local uh, broadcast company. Um, but, but basically what it is, is it's a small business, and it has um, had to grow from what it was um, 25 years ago when it started to what it is today and probably will be even more in the next 25 years. I am also a local person. I could not wait to get out of Coos Bay when I graduated. My aspirations were to get anywhere else in the world except Coos Bay and yet here I am 25 years later. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I had to go to college, that was an expectation. I had a very rigid um, existence. My dad owned a small business in this community. So I uh, worked after school through high school. Um, I didn't really have a lot of freedom until I went to school. And because my background knowledge in working was um, in business, I figured that's what I needed to do. And not too long after I got on campus and I got into some of the accounting classes that Carolyn talked about, I thought, this is, business is not for me. My passion is communication. So I changed my major um, and probably stayed here a little bit longer than I should have. Uh, but it also afforded me the opportunity to figure out and make mistakes with that newfound freedom um, of what I needed to do, which also helps me today in my career. Um, interestingly enough, though, I went, I went away to Oregon State for a bachelor's in liberal arts. It was kind of pieced together with an emphasis in broadcasting. And here I am, came back to work with TV News for KCBY, um, started my family, and then uh, decided I needed to change careers. So ironically, I went back to work for my dad's for my, my dad's business that he sold. 
And uh, that gentleman had two companies that he ran, not, not only Bay City's Ambulance, but also Hindsight's, which developed mountaintops for broadcast companies, um, high frequency, low frequency. And a construction permit came open for a radio station. Very new, we're only 25 years on the air. Radio's been around for more than 100 years. And here we were in a massively saturated market, trying to start up a standalone FM. And uh, he said, do you want to go to work for him? I said, sure, can't be that much different than TV news. And it was absolutely, completely different. There was nothing. I built the basis and forms, um, how the company was going to operate. Um, I, we had to build our brand. We had to build everything from the ground up, including a broadcast station. And so uh, I, I said, sure, went over there, and I've been, I've been there 25 years. And uh, so the other radio station personalities, almost all of them that were working in this market when we first went on the air have either worked for me and moved on or are still working for me today. So we're obviously doing something right. Um, and our business model has stood the test of time. And the ironic thing about my start, you know, which I got from Southwestern, is that I started in business, changed to broadcasting, and here I am running a business. My primary duties are sales. So I sell um, advertising um, to help other businesses be successful. But I also do a variety of other things from hiring, firing, negotiating contracts. Um, just last week I got in the office. I mean, you do a little bit of everything and that's the beauty of a small business is you get hands-on in everything, um, but you, it's also the burden because when times get tough, just like Jessica said, you have to step in and make sure that you can carry on. Um, I think even if you don't know where you're intended or that changes along your college career, what you're doing right now in meeting deadlines, um, you know, communicating with other people. Those are all things that you learn and can apply to whatever you do, whether it's running a small business, uh, but you, you're in, uh, somebody was in science. Um, you know, what you learn at college, uh, I would say the communications classes that I did at college didn't really prepare me for what I'm doing today, but there's a lot of other things that I did at college that have prepared me to be able to survive um, and help our business survive in this community. So, uh, or in any business community, it just so happens that, it, that it's here. And the one thing that I also wanted to say is what Carolyn said. It's, my passion was being able to uh, make a living at talking. <laughs> my mom, my mom said it best. She said, "If you're going to do something, um, you might as well. You like to talk, and you like to make money." And I do a lot of events. I do things like the Saturday. I'm, I'm seeing an event for a fundraiser for a nonprofit. Um, it it moves me out of my comfort zone but it's still something that's beneficial for my company and it's and it's important for me to be connected to the community but i enjoy that as well so as long as you have a passion you know you spend so much of your day of a 24-hour day with your job as young people find this out you know you your investment is your time and so you might as well invest your time in something that you love even on those days when it's tough and you don't get anything done that you thought you were going to get done um 
as long as you enjoy what you're doing at the end of the day, it makes it easier to get up in the morning and do it again all over again. So um, I, I brought notes. I didn't use them at all. Um, <laughs> so if you have any questions. Has the progression of technology affected the way you run business? Absolutely. It's made it so much easier. But at the same time, it's made it more difficult. Um, your generation um, has at its fingertips, you know, every available way to reach or hear information and music and everything else. And fortunately, because we're locally owned and operated, if we came up with some crazy idea like, gee, maybe we should start a website. Seriously, we were one of the first radio stations in this market to have a website. We looked at what was happening uh, with Sirius Satellite, and I just so happened to be attending an executive seminar at Georgetown University, because so I crashed course in, in executive training for radio stations. And they were all worried about this over here, and I was the smallest community represented in that room. I mean, this is Los Angeles, this, that, and the other thing. And, and I'm like, you guys, you're not looking at the picture here. You're looking at only what's happening right now. If you don't look beyond this and look at where the technology is going and how fast it's going, you are going to be left in the dust. And I was just shocked that I was the only little gal who came from Coos Bay, Oregon, that just, you know, uh, didn't know what she was going to do, was, was sitting there with all these executives from these large conglomerates, and they were worried about other things. But it is challenging because you have to, to try and keep up with it. I don't think you can stay ahead of it anymore. I really don't. I think you just have to try and keep up with it and try to keep advancing. What you're doing. We were also one of the first radio stations to stream, and uh, and I fought, I fought tooth and nail to have that done. If you can believe, I had to fight uh, ownership to make that happen because I'm trying to think how many years ago it was that that we did this. They're like, no, everybody's going to listen to the radio, and sure enough, here we are. People are streaming stuff in their cars. So we have to be able to reach a new generation, basically. Sorry, that's a long answer. That's the other thing. I'm not. I'm not quick like the accountant either. I'm kind of long-winded, and that's the unfortunate thing about being a broadcaster. Great example, because I know Stephanie a very long time. So when they first started, she had to physically get in her car, drive to the top of the mountain, and do a bunch of stuff physically to the radio. Right? Mm -hmm. And I remember lots of complaining and lots of stories about falling, like sliding in the mud, and that like something happened when she couldn't get up there, and the radio was having kind of nervous, it was really mm -hmm. many days. And now, I heard you say the other day, you do it home, you can do something remotely, right? You don't have to drive and physically get up there. So that would be an example of technology, because she used to really curse a lot when she had to go up and out. <laughs> yeah, and they're usually in remote areas. Ours is not that remote. So if you're driving, South of town, and you're by Fred Meyer, and you look to your right up on the mountaintop, there's a bunch of antennas. That's where we are. There are other radio stations in this market that have to drive miles up teeny tiny roads to get to their to get to their signals. And if you can imagine on the east side of the state, they do that in the winter with I don't know how many of snow, you know. So it's uh, but yeah, the technology has made it nice because it has afforded us the ability to do things easier and quicker, but it also is a challenge because you just have to, to keep up with it and try to figure out where it's headed next. Any other question? The radio side. Oh, and a radio station would not be a radio station without some sort of swag, and please help yourself to it. I prefer not to take it home. You guys are <laughs> Yeah. This is a... Uh, Promotions is another area that I do. So my day might be I go in and 
start writing orders for a sale that I made. And then in the middle of the day, um, I have to put in a digital order because we do graphics and websites. So maybe I have a client that needs some advertising done on social media um, or needs a change to a website. Um, and then I'll have to uh, take care of an email for some information that I sent off to be able to do promotions. Um, and I'll set up uh, you know, something like this. Um, and, and a lot of times I end up not getting, even getting to what I thought I was going to do in a day. Um, and it's there for me tomorrow. So, but yeah, we do a lot of community events and a lot of connection with the community. So we have plenty of stuff if you want to take some or some things or you know, just so. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Miles Phillips. I can see I'm the only one of you guys for Halloween tonight. <laughs> this is probably the only time this year I'll wear this jacket. I am a professor with Oregon State University Extension and I teach as an adjunct here at this talk at an office in the Newmark Center. And my area is tourism and outdoor recreation business development. But as an Extension professor, so I work for the Extension Service. Are you familiar with that? No. Anybody else? Not really. Extension is in every single county in the country and all the state universities, Oregon State University. Uh, they're really important. <laughs> Basically, it's to do work directly with the community and with businesses. So I don't teach undergraduate classes for that. Work directly with businesses and the community and on um, whatever issue come up in my topic is tourism and not directly. So with that, um, I can head up. Uh, what somebody has an unusual path, people have talked about changing direction. So in high school, I got cut into going into engineering and went to University of Illinois. I grew up in Minnesota, so I'll put that out there. And uh, went to University of Illinois for an engineering degree, one of the top engineering schools. But that combined with the fact that I had a full athletic scholarship uh, was what made me choose Illinois. So I, I got my engineering degree. It was going to, at the point, it was a mechanical engineering. It changed in the middle to a different subfield, which is general engineering, they called it, and did a minor in marketing. But I could tell my second year that I wasn't the hardcore engineer. So the marketing side of it was more interesting. And then, uh, uh, junior year, I said, you know, this, I'm not even sure this is it. I'm going for it. I'm almost, you know, done. But I went to a career counselor and did a big long battery in us, and they tell me, well, have you ever wanted to be, we got one of two things it looks, either an architect or a bus driver. And at that point, I kind of confirmed my opinion of career advice. Um, because <laughs> high school wasn't that good either. And um, the, the thing I would, I would say before I forget, is you brought it up, what questions I might, or what thing I might advise you as a student as you're exploring options is uh, maybe be a little more proactive in exploring and, and asking questions. Like being here is really good uh, because I kind of expected to be taught what the options were and what they were like. And then they said, what do you like? You know, do what you want to do. Well, I don't know what I want to do. I do want to make some money, but I never was told how much money this job makes or how many years it takes to get to that. It was hard to find that. It's much easier now. There's a lot more data out there. You can look at jobs. Uh, average salaries, you can look at start. But when you look at averages, you know, look at what it's are, what requirements for them, even within engineering. Uh, when I first started, oh, you get your engineering degree, that's it. No, like the accounting, you have to get your professional certification, which is what really matters. Um, in accounting and CPA and engineering, it's a, a PIP or professional engineering certificate, and you do a training on it. Until then, you can't sign documents, you know, you know that's a level. Uh, you can still work. And work. Um, so just be proactive, ask questions, do really small shadow jobs, whatever you can, and just um, explore. And out of those things that make enough money and you know, general style of life, you'll find the specific jobs. The other thing I'd say is go for whatever interests you right now, go hard at it, learn about it by being open for the because once they come, you can do it. But if you just don't go anywhere, you won't go anywhere. So 
Uh, my story though went from finished my engineering degree, went and it was difficult, you know, to get the job. This was in the 80s, early 90s, and uh, you know, sent out 100 applications, you get three interviews, and I actually got one job. But it took a lot of effort. I did first go to, let's see, uh, actually the first job, because it wasn't, it wasn't coming up, I had to take a job as a copier salesman and uh, proved that I wasn't the top salesman for the three months of that change. I got an engineering job in New York City. I went to New York City and uh, took a job with a firm that did various engineering, sheet mining, um, commercial site design, and some environmental work like looking at academic. And then did that for two years. And I was also tied to athletics. I was trying to make the Olympic teams with the New York Athletic Club and did a program with the Olympics for the years firm. But then I had the unfortunately the economy changed and they laid off half the office, including me. So lost my job and had to make a change. So after the 92 Olympics moved back to Minnesota, started hunting for a job, ended up with job in an engineering firm, environmental engineering, thought I could really like, and uh, essentially did project management. So even within engineering, we really became managing people, managing contracts, dealing with a lot of angry attorneys and agency people, and did that for uh, five years before I really decided I want my boss's job. Uh, he won, we, in consulting, you bill your time every 15 minutes, according to whatever you're working on. That gets to be challenging. And actually, the pay wasn't as good as you might think it was. It wasn't that great uh, for a lot of work until you really reach your way up. So that, that's another thing that's not really fun. So at that point, I looked around what I did really like to do. And I had always had a passion in conservation and, and enjoyed education at some point, but it wasn't like clearly one of the educator. And uh, <clears throat> looked at what was happening uh, in the conservation side for me. I always enjoyed hunting and getting out, but uh, there was more to the big picture of what's going on. And, and nonprofits were great, but I wasn't interested in uh, the nonprofit side. I wasn't going to do it. So I was really looking at how to make money in conservation, so for profit conservation, that term of ecotourism, and kind of what that meant. Decided so to go back. Uh, if I wanted to change careers, I needed a new degree to really break in. So I, went, I quit my job and went to graduate school. And that was really good. So we got, went and got a master's degree in West Virginia. But before, when I quit my job, my boss was saying, okay, you're going to take on this project and that. What do you want to do this year? I'm like, thanks, but I quit. And uh, went to South America for six months, to volunteer in Ecuador, learned what's going on there, learned some Spanish, came back. Took a job after graduate school with the University of Texas in South Carolina. And that turned out to be great. It's very dynamic the extension service. So I, my day is totally varied. A lot more time on the computer than I would like, but I'm developing training programs, online courses. I'm researching what's happening in the world in various different Sometimes get to work with radio folks. Sometimes get to work with uh, uh, accountants, uh, attorneys. Get to go to a lot more interesting events and parties than in engineering. Um, the <laughs> The, get sometimes go out with the tour company to see what they're doing, get to meet them, help them. It's a really incredible opportunity because Extension is a government agency that has no rules to enforce. We're all there to basically assist other people and succeed. And that's a phenomenally rewarding opportunity. Um, and so that the job is very, you get to uh, travel for work. Uh, it's pretty much don't have to, but um, I just got back from Sweden, spent two weeks in Sweden and France for the Adventure Travel Trade World Summit. Incredible dynamic, successful companies running tour operation. Uh, and then uh, spent a week in Astoria last week hosting our National Extension Sustainable Tours and Outdoor Recreation Conference. Uh, but before I'm taking a group of people to Costa Rica over New Year's, in case anyone wants to go, I got one spot left. And then uh, we'll take another group in February, uh, going to Florida in February to speak at a conference about a new marine reserve training program we've done. So it's got me in a whole lot of different opportunities. It's a okay, it's not nothing like the, the 
other ventures that I went with, they got into stock trading and you know businesses. They all make more in a month than I make in a year, but um, I have a lot more flexibility. But like they leave home Sunday night or on the road back till Friday night every single week of the year. So I guess um, I didn't tell you the whole path, but I've, I've lived in say, my path in South Carolina went the economy crashed again in 2001. Uh, I didn't lose my job, but another job opening came up. And uh, you know, these opportunities come, you see job announcements. I didn't even read it their way. Someone sent it to me again two weeks later. I read it and I thought, oh, it looks like they wrote this just for me. We started a new position. I ended up taking that, going to Texas, worked in Texas for 15 years with a lot of ranchers. Well, Oregon State University three years ago decided they needed an extension tourism person. They didn't have one before, uh, created a position, hired me to come out of Texas. So you don't know where the careers necessarily take it, but go for what you want and be open to new opportunities. Uh, with the other aspects of what person valuable in work. I think even with what I'm doing within tourism, a lot of people get into tourism that weren't trained in tourism. So because they come from various careers, if you're a CPA, you can still work for a hotel or a resort or a tour operator or or travel Oregon or Oregon Coast Visitor System, all these the visitor center here. Um, if you're like looking at different roles within that, there's there's even the mechanical side, the IT side, huge. I mean Travel and tourism was one of the early leaders in using IT with things, you know, online booking and, and that changed the industry totally. In fact, you may have heard, but Thomas Cook World Travel was a huge travel company. He was the oldest travel company was since the early 1800s, just went bankrupt because they had been too slow to adopt a lot of online and IT technology. Uh, so they let us, I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, so I guess that's a real whirlwind of, of my past, and I think it's it's been phenomenal. Um, and take any questions you may have, and also be available later. Anybody? Yeah. Did you go to the ninety two Olympics? Ah, uh, no, I didn't go. Uh, I got hurt in eighty eight. And I ended up six at nationals, and they take five people. Since 1896, they always took the five person team. Or in 92, I lost a Spanish guy in the World Cup in France after winning that later on. So I ended up fourth in our rankings, and that year they decided to take a three person team. So I didn't get to go. That's fourth. And I was offensive. Yeah, that's the fourth rank. So, yeah. um, so uh, yeah, didn't make it. Didn't make it. We got a lot of good, good, you know, still good connections. Yeah, you doing tourism outside of um, your American service? Uh, yeah, no, I well, so the, what I've done, travel, both travel, and I'd say one of the things that got me to switch careers it took a little bit, but in '94, right at the end of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, real short, because my grandfather passed away, he left a little bit of money to the family. My folks decided to use that. Let's all go on a family trip to South Africa. We spent a month in Southern Africa, and that sat with me, just especially the professionalism of the guides. Like the difference in an experience with professional guides when you're going someplace, whether it's because of the culture or the wildlife, just and then, but actually, that's the major focus of my career. And we have a new guide training program here in Oregon. That's, that's looking to expand nationally and international. Um, but the so Africa with that, that's amazing. And then Europe through fencing, I was going to Europe, you know, living on cargo backs and going to Europe every couple of weeks. Um, basically to see the inside of the gym and come home. But uh, it still gave me exposure. And then with traveling to South America for that six months before I did grad school, then I been leading trips to Costa Rica since 2010. Um, actually, with fencing experience, too, in Venezuela. That was very exciting to travel for that. Um, traveled to Peru, and we did uh, treks around the Cordillera Whitewash, which is like the, I think the 
the highest I've ever been, 17,000 feet. Um, was in Argentina two years ago and Peru again. Uh, based on the trip to Peru, I met the Minister of Economic Development in Belize and then went to Belize last year. And so uh, I haven't been to Asia, but all those experiences are really neat because you come back and you can see that things were doing great in our community and think, wow, you know, we really could do something different. And there's more opportunities here than maybe are being taken advantage of. So, how is you're the OSU extension person for tourism. How are you basically constrained? How are more tourists stop by jobs? Because, uh, this is my word, because it was the area that needed the most help uh -huh. on the South Coast. Really, my duties are to support the entire coast. And I actually work for, it's OSU, but I actually technically work for Oregon Sea Grant, which is OSU Oregon Sea Grant, which there's land grant institution, which is OSU. And then Sea Grant, um, so the land grant system, public universities to get information to the public uh, was developed in the 1860s. In the 1960s, the really the oceans of the industry, we need the same thing. So they developed sea grant, and that's who I work for both of them. And so they, uh, some of us are off campus, those people at Hatfield and Newport, there's the county office in Borough Point. Um, but I have an office at Bandit Dunes Golf Resort at the Wild Rivers. Center, then just last year, we set up an office here at the New Market Center. So we kind of have to do more business support right now. So basically, because we're the neediest of the state, it's going to be like the, the governor said, where's the quickest opportunity to create new jobs and business growth? And uh, tourism was one of the opportunities that was before I got here. And that's what kind of led to some of the opportunities to grow. And then you look at the biggest employer. So government is banned in dunes, the, the recreation and tourism, and the biggest real estate taxpayer is banned in dunes. We have 550 employees plus almost 300 independent contractors in the um, They're expanding. Uh, so it's an element of the community that um, there's still a lot of opportunity in. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place here. So, but, so what's one of the like coolest things you've been able to do or that you're working on right now? With well, the guide training, working with guys and the amazing talents they have and trying to help them make sure they take advantage of the business side because they usually know exactly what they're doing. But if things change in the industry, whether it's technology or trends or regulations, uh, we're trying to, most of them haven't did it. They didn't have training, they kind of just did it. And so we're, we're adapting. In fact, we just launched last week the current training, four online courses, and then we do workshops on um, could be liability, social media marketing, business planning, budgeting, things like that. So for me, that's it, um, along with these opportunities to maybe do some demonstration tours and kind of break open the market and turn this over to other businesses. I do have internships too. I don't teach students. Except for here, the new hospitality and tourism management program here at Fox is just getting started. And right now, I think I'm scheduled to teach in the spring uh, tour of the Pacific Northwest. Otherwise, um, I do hire interns um, or take um, volunteer interns. And with a volunteer, we can be flexible, be really flexible. Could be two week project, could be a volunteer. Paid internships are usually during the summer. Um, full time during the summer, and usually have two or three of those. And they get some pretty good experiences um, working with professionals and meeting others, working with me, but also independently. And that could be with me, that was a nice thing. I've had uh, public policy people, I've had communications and video people, I've had marine scientists, I've had wildlife and fishery biologists, so because tourism is really just an umbrella term for. Especially when it ties into the triple bottom line uh, accounting system, which is basically environment, economic, and social responsibility. Thank you. Right. Hi, this is Short and uh, Down and Dirty. Um, so, 
I'm one of those ones who came to school after my initial career. I own a screen printing company in Eugene. I started it in the garage and 20 years later, somebody wanted to buy it. So I said, yes. Now at that point, after selling it, I was like, what do I want to do? You know, what makes me happy, which is what we all should be doing is uh, our happiness. And because of that, I wanted to open a cafe on the Oregon coast. That was my dream. And so I thought about it and I thought, well, I've been cooking my entire life. We all cook in some fashion. And I said, I don't have enough skills for this. I just don't. So I Googled pastry school and uh, OCCI here at SWAP came up. And I remember calling Lynn Whitley. Do you guys know Lynn? The blonde woman in the cafeteria, the catering director. You'll see her. You know her. So she was a recruiter at that time. This was five years ago. And so I came and visited the, the school and toured it. And I said, this is exactly what I need. I need this to further my career into having a cafe. So um, when I arrived at OCCI, I was a 49-year-old student. And I just immersed myself into the duty. Um, the kitchen's five hours a day, five days a week. But I was there 12 hours a day. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to do whatever I had to do to learn as much as I could because I was paying for it and because I could be there, right? So um, my aspirations to have a cafe were put on hold when I became an assistant and then assistant to the recruiter and then an assistant to the director. And then finally, at some point, they said, hey, you're a great recruiter for our school. Would you like that job? And so I had this path to go and own a cafe, but it kind of just took a turn, and I became the admissions recruiter for the culinary school, which I still currently have here at SWAC. And so I don't know if you've ever seen me walking around with other students, but high school students from all over the country come here to see SWAC, and I give them tours and hopefully get them to come to school here. So here I am, I'm loving my job, I'm recruiting, and I get a phone call from the North Bend Medical Center. Do you guys know that here? It's a little medical center by the hospital. And they are building a million dollar lobby, um, and they wanted to put a cafe in it. And so they called our school and said, hey, we'd like you guys to take over this cafe that we're building. And so I did a proposal, and I submitted it to the college, to the president, and they said, it's a great idea, but we can't do it right now. So that was a little bummer because I was going to run this cafe and that would have gave my, my dream that I wanted to run a cafe. But because they said no, I said, well, maybe I can do it personally. So what I did was I wrote my proposal and they actually picked mine out of five others. So um, here I was having a full-time job here and I just got um, a <laughs> hand in the cafe. So two years later, here we are. Uh, it's in the lobby of the North Bend Medical Center. It's called Sea Level Cafe. Uh, a typical day is you have the people who are getting blood work that so have to fast overnight. So we call them the zombies because they can't eat or drink anything until they get blood. So they're waiting out there at 6 30 and they open the doors and they all rush in and get blood. And then they come and they, they storm the cafe. So we have our croissants there, we have our breakfast sandwiches and coffees and things. So a typical day is just having our bakers bake all this fresh stuff and to get everything turned on and all that. And then throughout the day, there's at least a thousand people that walk by our cafe every day. And so we have to do the solutions like, somebody's I'm allergic to this or I don't like this. And you have to think on your feet like, okay, we don't have to use that, we'll substitute it with this. So if I can teach you anything, it would be to have solutions to problems, you know? Um, be creative when you are anywhere, whatever you're doing, the person that is a solution, so a problem solver, they're the ones who are going to be recognized and they're the ones who get things done and people see that networking wise. Um, advice, I go for things that are challenging. I, I like to work hard and so if somebody says, oh, we have to feed 100 people but we only have $200 budget, you know, it's like, well, how can I do this, okay? You can do that with any occupation. You can say, okay, how can I solve this? And um, networking, don't burn bridges, make friends. So if you need somebody, and just remember, like, if you're doing something and you don't know how to do it, maybe there's somebody that you met that can, and that's how you just grow your network, and, and who knows, that can become another job someday, too. So, I don't know what else. It's pretty, you know, culinary arts is pretty self-explanatory. Um, 
I cooked for just 49 years, every, almost every day. But until I took the culinary and the baking, I didn't know anything, truly. Um, it is, it's really changed my life and I could travel anywhere in this world and I did a job. So um, it's a happiness job, that maybe not a millionaire's job, but um, sometimes happiness is worth more than money. Any questions? I have heard that your songs are really, really good. Thank I you. Know, I was just gonna say, I'm one of those people that actually drives there <laughs> to get their first song. Yeah. Yeah. I've been going in to see the doctor and run into coworkers coming out with their first songs. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun when I'm traveling recruiting. Uh, I'll see something at a local, like a Montana bakery, and I'll, it's pretty cool. And I'll take a picture and I'll send it to my bakers. And I'm like, hey, you guys make this tomorrow. So that's pretty cool, you know. Um, you have that freedom to do that as a business owner. Yeah, I have a question for you. I'm seeing this a lot, and it is there are really big the local food movement, especially with travel. How was that? Well, and it was the school. So, you mean the culinary school in general? Yeah, don't worry about it. Well, so the whole farm to table is, is the natural meat movement, of course. And we have our garden and greenhouse, which is lovely, but of course, we can't sustain that. We have 75 students or so, you know. Um, so we have to supplement it with the, we certainly use the, the local purveyor of, of food, but we also use the national Cisco and food service. So because we use so much food every day, um, we can't sustain that. But the, the restaurants that have the gardens on their roof and the, the way that they can use what they're doing and to uh, keep it simple and, and don't put the preservatives in there and stuff, so our croissants, they get sold out every day. They probably wouldn't even last three days because we, it's this butter flour, you know, uh, water, and that's not pretty much it. So um, to be able to make something fresh every day, uh, it's just amazing. And that's, you know, you could buy it in the frozen kind and just bake it, but if you can make it fresh, I don't know how you can translate that to what you guys can do. But. Well, they all have to eat. <laughs> well, I, I always tell people when I'm recruiting, there's three professions that you can live anywhere in the world. Medical, of course, culinary, because everybody eats everywhere, and assassins. And uh, <laughs> I say, it's funny, funny enough, we all have lives, so it's, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. But, yeah, so the culinary, it, it, the culinary arts is direct, uh, uh, like, a pinpoint. It's not like this, you know, it's, it's definitely, you have to love being, in the kitchen, you have to love making food for people, maybe not for yourself. That's the other thing I tell everybody is they go, oh, I don't really like mushrooms. I'm like, remember, you're not making it for you. You're making it for others. So, yeah. So networking, guys, problem solving, taking on those challenges, okay? And uh, school's great. I wish I would have done it. That's it? Any questions? Yes, you guys can come over and eat. Thank you. Yeah, yeah go get your swag. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can, you all can take some too. I didn't just the students. And yeah, I set up the here. internships yeah. for the college, so if you are interested in using that, so you might come see me. Yeah.